but just how exactly is oxidation carried around in the blood? What does it look like? How about an LDL particle? Hang on a second. Didn't you just tell us that LDL wasn't dangerous? Yeah, I did. That's true. People with higher LDL levels on average do live longer, but LDL particles can become oxidised when they react with other oxidised substances. You see, normally in the blood, there's a single healthy population of LDL in a normal distribution, as shown by a single peak here in yellow in the LDL section. This LDL won't harm you. The size and density, though, of LDL changes when it becomes damaged, of which oxidation is a major cause. In this sample, you can see four distinct populations of LDL, three more than normal, representing the presence of oxidised and damaged LDL. And this LDL is often referred to as small dense, given that as they oxidise, the LDL particles become microscopically smaller. And while most people who have heart attacks have normal total levels of LDL, there being no difference in the total LDL levels in those with and without heart attacks, when we look at oxidised LDL, it's a different story. Look at the level of damaged LDL in the age group on the left without heart disease compared with the two groups on the right with heart disease. Night and day. Oxidised LDL, of course, or any other blood oxidation product is able to damage this furry layer which lines our blood vessels called the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx is perhaps the most important level of protection against atherosclerosis that most people, doctors included, have never heard of. Amongst other things, it shields the artery wall from coagulation particles, secretes antithrombin-3 that inhibits clots from forming, and stimulates the production of nitric oxide itself another potent inhibitor of coagulation. The fact that oxidised LDL damages a glycocalyx significantly increases the risk of atherosclerosis. And oxidation stress too appears to be the cause of calcification within arteries. You see, oxidation has been shown to lead to DNA damage, which leads to the expression of a moiety called poly-ADP ribose. This then lays down calcium within the lining of arteries. That coronary artery calcification is associated with unstable plaques and heart attack is therefore probably not a coincidence. Interestingly, statins are also known to damage DNA, a fact apparent to the Japanese scientists who stopped researching the mycotoxin which eventually became the first statin because of the increased rate of cancer in dogs which makes it unsurprising that statins also significantly increase coronary artery calcification. This ties in with the most common cause of sudden heart attacks, which is not the presence of atherosclerotic plaques themselves, but rather the plaques rupturing. High calcium scores indicate an increased tendency for atherosclerotic plaques to rupture. In the case of the rupture of an existing atherosclerotic plaque, the resulting thrombus that forms can be so large that it completely occludes the vessel, resulting in a heart attack. Atherosclerotic plaques themselves, though, while narrowing arteries, do not usually lead to complete occlusion. They restrict flow, but they don't completely obliterate it. This then affords the opportunity for something called angiogenesis, or the creation of new blood vessels. Essentially, when a blood vessel becomes too narrow to carry the desired volume of blood, new blood vessels can be created as a detour around the restriction. This is why coronary artery calcium scores are a much better predictor of cardiac death than vessel narrowing itself, because they reflect the stability of the plaque or its tendency to rupture and form an occlusive thrombus. This study, for example, found that once calcium scores exceed 100, representing the presence of unstable plaques, it doesn't matter whether or not blood vessels are narrowed. The risk of cardiac events or death remains the same. Essentially, if your calcium score is over 100, the data suggests that invasive angiograms where dye is injected so the outline of blood vessels can be seen, 
is largely pointless. This is why stenting the blood vessels to open them up also doesn't improve survival in heart disease. So while it can partially open occluded blood vessels that can help with symptoms such as angina, stenting doesn't eliminate the risk of sudden blockage, which in fact is actually what kills people. This study published in 2007 randomised 2,287 patients with heart disease to receive either stenting plus drugs or drugs alone. And stenting was shown to be of no benefit. More recently, this 2020 study randomised 5,179 patients with heart disease to either stenting plus drug management or drug management alone. And again, it found absolutely no mortality benefit to stenting. 